Hi, I'm Sebastian. I am Matteo. And we're going to give a workshop on neural networks applied to computer vision and how to debug problems that happen in neural network training. Yeah, there will be some sort of two major uh, parts here which are interacting. So one is uh, reviewing sorts of end-to-end um, -end pipelines for uh, various computer vision tasks on a toy application for demonstration purposes. And alongside, we are going to show, Sebastian is going to show uh, the, some training issues and how to solve them. So the tasks we are going to present are actually, so, so this is the data set we're going to work uh, for this toy, uh, toy application. So this will be a data set of um, images uh, of basically a, a, a in representing integer additions, okay? And out of, of these guys, we're going to do three things. First thing is semantic segmentation. So se semantic segmentation is a general uh, task, is a very hard task in general, and it's about to label each pixel of an image uh, according to what, 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 what is it showing. So this thing would be car, this thing would be road, this thing would be street sign, and, and so on, buildings. So we are going to um, uh, segment this image into background, which, which, would be, which is represented as white pixel in this mask. The plus sign, we're going to segment the, the, the digits the, 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 the single digits. Then we are going to also, where is it, addition. So we are going to actually uh, regress the result of the, of the operation. And yeah, that's it. And also character counting. So we are, we are going to count the number of characters here. So this is what one of our training example looks like, input. 2 plus 89, target sum is in any one, count is four characters, and the mask, that's a mask. So, first of all, we have to generate this synthetic data set, and you just have to run this block here, data generation, without caring too much about it. So let's look at it that we generated. So let's, this is the actual, this actual thing you're required to do to generate the data set. So this is an example of two. Uh, examples, we have input, target sum, and the mask. So the mask, so these images are 18 by 40 images. So the mask will be a matrix of 18 by 40. And we can show using a replot some nice visualization of, of the mask. So here's a random sample of how many, 10 examples of the data set. So let's start with the sum task. So sum task is so this part and this part of the data set, basically. And we're going to tackle this task using this network. So I will now spend some time commenting on, on how this network is built. So uh, of course, a very uh, basic uh, building block for deep learning computer vision application. You have a bunch of convolution layers and a bunch of uh, nonlinearities. So this ramp here is, not, is, is equivalent to this guy. which is the usual uh, ReLU nonlinearity. Maybe you're more familiar. We have also this nice shortcut here. So um, what is usually, I'm sorry? Ah, still bigger? Okay, sure. Okay. So what it's usually used alongside, so usually before some of these ramp guys, um, it's very common to use this batch normalization layer, which basically, uh, standardized mean and, mean and variance of a mini batch during training and makes, makes stuff converge faster and converge more nicely. We are going to use it only once for, for simplicity. So um, what else can we say about this? Uh, let's look at the representation size. So in this task, we're going to input an image and output the sum of the numbers, so a vector. So um, our, our input will be a one by 18 by 40 tensor, one is the number of color channels because the, the, these, image are, these images are grayscale. And as it usually happens in these kinds of tasks, this representation, at least for the spatial size, is shrinked 
as the processing goes on. So you, you start with 18 by 40, you got 9 by 20, 5, 10, 3, 5. Um, and uh, the number of channels is treated differently. So let's talk about the number of channels. You may see that we have, so this, this architecture features uh, a number of these um, three um, co convolutional layers with kernel size three by three. So this three is the kernel size with this equivalent to this thing, which is probably more clear. So we have a number of these guys which, oh, uh, I should have mentioned. So these, these downsamplings are realized with uh, strided convolutions. Usually uh, people use pooling layers too, but we are not using them here. Actually we will, but for a different purpose later. Um, so about the, about, about the channel. So you, may, you will see we have these three by three convolution layers here, which are sandwiched by one by one convolutions every time. So this thing is uh, a typical uh, architectural um, trick which is used to, uh, in literature. It, it, it's actually an overkill for this toy task, but it's just to show you how things are done usually. So this thing is called bottleneck architecture. And basically, you have to compare this with uh, an architecture in which you don't have these sandwiches. It's only, you only have the three by three convolutions stacked one after another, and the size of the kernel is three by three every time. It's called bottlenecks. Uh, yeah, it's called bottlenecks because you're basically uh, shrinking. So suppose you remove all these. So uh, w you have to compare this with an architecture in which all the convolutions are three by three and all the channels are 16. Okay, so it's called bottleneck be because suppose you have 16 channels incoming, you squeeze them into eight channels using this one by one guy. As it, yeah, you squeeze them into eight channels and you do the three by three convolution, which is the costly one between two feature maps which have eight channels instead of 16. And this aids you, uh, it provided that you don't shrink too much because otherwise you, you, you know, you, you're, you're, you're losing too much information. This gives you a uh, lot of nice properties uh, uh, which are basically, uh, with respect to the plain three by three stack, you have less parameters, so less prone to overfitting. You have more non-linearity because you can put more non-linearities here in between the steps. So the model gets more expressive, and since you have less parameters, you're, the thing is also faster. Yeah. No, the, it, it's it's just you you as 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 a like what happens in this case usually is that you stack one after another until you reach the performance you 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 want. It's like it, this is Lego blocks. This is plain Lego blocks. Nothing more than that. So. Uh, after this stack of convolution with this like uh, fancy batch norm uh, alone here, uh, at some point we flatten, so we come to 16 channels, three by five, special size, we flatten all this into a 240 size vector, and then we use a linear layer which is, an, uh, is a fully connected layer, so it does just do doing a matrix multiplication uh, using a 240 by one matrix, so actually, okay. And this one thing is what we'll hope will be the, the final sum, okay? So let's extract our training set uh, out of the, the bigger set. So this is a sum training set, and I'll show you, you know. Oh, ah, okay, it should be, it's, it's the other syntax, so what is it? All, yeah. So input, output, input, and output. Okay, and let's train. So we have, we have designed this example to be quick, so this guy will train in less than a minute. We have uh, training loss, validation loss. Uh, okay, uh, well, we, well, other people will be using a CPU, so it's better to keep it, to keep the pace. I, I will switch to, CPU, to GPU at some point. Well, the more bottlenecks you put, the more powerful the model is. So like, you will achieve in the end a lower training error. But 
so you will do better, better in training. This is usual machine learning generalization problem. The more expressive your model is, the more you can feed your training set better, but you actually don't care about that. You care about the validation and the test loss. And you, you, basically, you basically have to compare that with the amount of data you have. So if you have a lot of data, you can afford to train a powerful model because, because you, it will keep still generalized well. So it's, since usually in real life, what it's fixed, more or less fixed is the amount of data, that's your budget, basically. And you have to, so that's what you, the power, that's what you can afford in terms of how powerful your model is. That sets the scale. Okay, so this is our final train sum net. So we're getting four samples from the test set now. So remember, these guys are all images. So these are, these, is, these are the images, and the sum is supposed to be, and let's see how well we did. Well, it's quite, it, it, it's not perfect, but it's quite reasonable, and trust me, if, if I run for 400 rounds instead of 200, you, you, you would see a better result, okay? Okay, yeah, just to prove that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mind is not there. <laughs> yep. Your, my microphone is not, okay. Um, yeah, I see it now. Talking in direction, it's just, I don't know. Uh, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Someone help me. <laughs> That's quite annoying. Uh, lower. Uh, that, that's a bad idea, actually. <laughs> Is it there? Okay, I, I can talk loudly. Like, I'm quite good at talking loud, so I. <laughs> okay, let's do 500. using GPU power. And let's see if we're doing better. Well, we are. Look, we are much closer than before. Yes, I'd say that we are. Okay, let's move on to counting. So now, architecture for counting, so this is very similar. They are, they are sharing basically the same, the, the same part, which will lead us then to the multitask thing. So this will be much quicker. This part is exactly the same part of the summing nets. Actually, this part is exactly the same of the summing nets, except that here, so we still had a linear layer for the summing parts, but with different dimensionality because now we are going to, so in, uh, in deep learning, classificate, this is a classification task. So you either classify the, 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 um, the, the image as having three, four, or five characters because we are only, we're using up to two digit numbers. So you can have two characters if, 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 the, if, the, if the image is like two plus three, you have two plus three, and you can have as high as five. So we have three classes. So what changes here is that, so we are not, maybe this is more, more explicit. Our final linear layer, we want to output a length three vector, which going into the softmax layer is basically normalized and it's turned into the probabilities of the image having three digits, having, um, sorry, uh, three characters, four characters or five characters. And this is also stated by this guy which is a decoder uh, of type class with classes three, four, five. The reason why I could also do this thing, so not specifying the final dimensionality, is because this guy is present here. So there is an inference system which detects, oh, you know, I have three classes, okay, so like the output of this network must be a length three vector, and so I can infer this thing to be a tree, okay? This, 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 this is automatically detected anyway. And you can see it also here, size three. Okay, so let's extract the, 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 the relevant data set for this particular task and start training again.
as you see, generalization is actually better in this case than in some case because the validation is tracking the, the, the training loss more closely. The blue is the validation. <laughs> yeah, of course, sure. And also there's a nice feature. When you put a validation set, your final train nets will not be the network at the end of the training, but it will be the network which had the best validation loss throughout. So that's a way in which you can prevent over. It, it, it's basically implementing early stopping automatically. It tracks the training loss closely. Yes, that's that's that that's a common machine learning uh, like uh, phenomenology, <laughs> if you want. So that means that uh, from that point on, you are only so the training the the, the orange curve. Let's do it again. But it's, so the orange curve is the actual error you are, you are iteratively trying to minimize, okay? You're optimizing the, the orange curve. The, the blue curve is the validation loss, and it's basically, you, that's not part of the training. You're not optimizing those values. Those are tests. So as training move on, you do your stuff in your training set, and you check how well you're doing on other stuff that you didn't specifically optimize for. And this is used because in machine learning you actually care about the other thing, okay? So sometimes when, so this, this thing is now directly perfect. This was even more perfect than before because basically the, the initialization is random so you, 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 every training is different. Um, if the blue thing stays where is it forever, it means that from that point on you are only, basically you're not gaining a, a, anything more. Because you are very, very, you're doing very good on your training set, but that's not what, what you're caring about. So if the, if, the, if the validation set, the validation loss gets a constant, that, that's the best, like that value is the best thing you're going to, to have. These are good indications that there's probably no point in going on with training anymore if that thing stays constant for a long time. Okay, so let's test the thing again. Uh, okay, these are the images from the test set. So these, these are images the network has never seen. And it's telling me that this guy has five dig digits, this guy has four, this has five, and this is four, so we're happy, okay? So for classification, we have a um, nice um, way to evaluate performance and various properties, which is this classifier measurements function. So here you put, I put in the, um, the final uh, trained net, and this is basically the test set, okay? So this is like measure stuff about my final training net on this test set. This returns a classifier measurement object that you can query for some of the properties. There are a lot. Let's just pick two. This is the accuracy. So this is the fraction of test uh, examples which are correctly classified, which is one. So we are perfect. And this is the confusion matrix plot which tells you, um, let's see, actual class, predicted class. So this means that uh, there were six images with four digits in a test set, and all six have been predicted as having um, four digits. So, of course, if this guy is one, it means that there will be no of diagonal elements here, okay? Unfortunately, we have no three-digit numbers in the test set, and you may, if this sounds uh, suspicious to you, you're right, but Sebastian is gonna tell, about, tell you about that later. Okay, so let's move on to the most fancy task of the three, which is a segmentation thing. So these, so the previous architecture, we were outputting either a single number or a length three vector, but here, we want to do pixel-wise classification. So for each pixel, we want to, to classify whether it's a background pixel or a one pixel or a two pixel or a plus sign pixel and so on and so on. So our output needs to be an image of the same size of the starting image. So we are, we, we, the, that 
um, shrinking architecture I showed you in which you shrink this as representation, of course, cannot apply here. So what is usually done is that the representation size is shrunk down and then it's upsampled again to match the, the, um, the input size. And you can see it here. Input is 18 by 40 and this goes down and then goes up, so it goes up again. Um, let's see what else. So upsampling is usually, is either performed using deconvolution layers or just uh, basically what we call a resize layer here. Uh, what is it? Yeah. So this thing is basically, so the convolution layer is a learned upsampling. So you have a, a, set, of, a set of parameters uh, to perform the upsampling and you learn them. This thing has no parameters, no learned parameters, and this is just basically computing a linear interpolation of, of your input. Lin either linear or, so this is resampling linear, you can also have resampling uh, uh, nearest using nearest neighbor interpolation. So it's, it's a fixed operation. Um, so this is the upsampling step. This is, some, this is just a utility we don't really care about. It's just to match, this is it's just padding with zeros to, to actually match the output because after downsampling and resampling we didn't get exactly the same size as the input but that's what we want so we have to pad. Okay. So this is another convolution layer. So this thing is actually acting as a um, fully connected layer, as a linear layer. The difference is that basically he, we, what this layer is doing is that it's performing um, the usual um, fully connected layer before classification for each pixel position, because that's what we want. And in fact, be careful, no ramp after this, because you're not actually using this guy as a convolution. You're using this guy a as a linear layer which, which has to slide over each pixel because that's what you want. And that's the usual softmax at the end. I'm sorry? Um, you're right. It's in the, in the hidden data set thing I made you evaluate blindly, okay? But it, that, that's just, that's a number, that's 12 because you have 10, uh, 10 digits, plus sign, and background. Yeah. Cool, okay. So let's extract the relevant part of our training set. And this is the, 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 the step in which I'm going to train on GPU <laughs> because it's faster. So on CPU, this will take you probably five or six minutes or seven minutes, depending on the CPU. But we don't want to waste that much time. So we are going to waste 20 seconds, which is better. And again, super perfect generalization. Look at that. Boom. So again, inputs and masks with a fancy array plot to show Otherwise, it, it will show a matrix, which that's not very exciting. So here, oh, this I should have mentioned. So uh, actually, it's, it's even written right here. So I've shown you the class net decoder. So here we are doing a classification for each pixel. So this is also some kind of more general class net decoder, but we have no such thing yet. So what the network will output is, um, is a matrix, but at each pixel position, you won't have the class, but you will have the softmax probability, so the, the, the probability of that pixel belonging to each class, for each pixel, okay? So what I'm doing here, and in fact you can see it here, this guy outputs an 18 by 40, which is the size of the image times 12, okay? Times the, the, the number of classes. So what I'm doing here is that I simply, I, I have to do what the net decoder is not doing for me, so it's just I have to pick the, the class with max probability for each pixel, and that's what this function is doing. So let's evaluate our segmentation, and wow, it's absolutely perfect. So, um, if this, okay, you, you, may, you, you, may, you, may, you may say, oh, you're this, there's some, you know, you're copying the, the masks, you're not doing anything. I'll show you that if I train for less time, it's actually worse than that. 
uh, well, let's let's let let not show a completely messed up. <laughs> oh, it's it, it's completely messed up as well. Okay, so you can see this is this is the state of the network after 100 training rounds. But after 300, you get the perfect thing. <laughs> you like this more? The plus is almost there. You're right. Okay, so now it's Sebastian's turn. Okay, so thanks, Matteo. Uh, so these, these three examples, we're going to try to put them together in a single network at the end. Like, we're going to build towards that. But there's a little interlude now with training failures. So there's sort of a common list of things that often go wrong if you try and train these yourself. So, sorry, this is a foreign laptop. Okay. Okay. So the first thing that, that often happens is something called overfitting. You've probably heard of this. So because this is like the most, probably the most important thing that goes wrong, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, just showing, explaining exactly what overfitting actually is and visualizing it. So the way you see it often is, the one curve goes down very fast, the other one stays up the validation curve. It doesn't track it. That's the symptom. So what exactly is it? So you can actually visualize this quite nicely if you have, uh, yeah, just create some random data. So we're going to have, this is a sine curve. And we've added a bit of noise to the sine as well. We're just adding a bit of Gaussian noise. So the question is, how do we learn? Uh, yeah, how do we learn to fit this thing? So, if we have a network with a lot of layers, this is like a very yeah, 300 layers. This has hundreds of thousands of parameters. This network. So we can try to train it, and what happens? The loss goes down a lot. Looks like it's going well. And we might as well stop it. And if we plot it. OK, I should have actually trained for a bit longer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. OK. What? OK, it's. It's unexpected. Yeah, it was doing something very different previously. OK. There is randomness involved here. So let's try it again. Yeah, this last already looks much lower. Okay, I have hope now. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, can I expand this? Or whatever. OK, so we had some data that was a, a sine curve. And you can see the red curve here is the sine. And for some reason, and this has, yeah, our data had a bit of noise. And because we had enough capacity in this network, it's strong enough to actually just fit through the noise points. So it's basically modeling, it, it's just trying to fit these points instead of working out, OK, the actual curve looks more like this. So it's fitting the noise. So you don't, want, yeah, you don't want something like this. And what happens then is that if you sampled from this distribution more, you know, it has equal probability of the point being there or there. So the best guess is exactly this point over here. But because this network is going off somewhere up here, its predictions are going to be terrible if you tried it on other data from this distribution. So the first question is, how do you actually know that this is, this is happening? So the most obvious way is that you have a validation set that is not, so data that is not in the test set. And what you often see is this sort of pattern. The training set goes down, and the validation set either goes up. In this case, it's just going up and up. Have a look at this. So it goes down for a bit, and then the validation set sort of stops, and then it, the, the error goes up on the validation set. And we can even, you know, we can try to calculate what, what this is. Um, we can see that on the, the training data, the error is very small. 
but on the test data, the error is quite high. So this really destroys training. So how do we, yeah, what do we do about this? So I'm going to give, like, I think four different solutions and then give recommendations about what I think the best way of dealing with this is. So the most simple way is that you reduce the net capacity. So you reduce the number of parameters. Previously, the, it had lots of parameters. So 300, 200, 100. And it had lots of layers. So I could say, OK, let's make this a much smaller network. It has just two layers or three layers. It has yeah, very few parameters, and we can just train this. OK, finished. And we can visualize this now. And you can see that this network now, the, the black, it's very close to what the actual sine curve was. And if you train this with a validation set, you can see what happens. The, oh, oops, that was too fast. But you can have it over here. So the validation set, it just keeps going down. And we can also obviously look at this. And we see that the loss on the test set, on the training set, is quite, well, it's similar to what the, the loss is on the, uh, on the validation set. So the major downside of the solution is that it's very hard to tweak the capacity prob properly. Like these are, you have to control both the number of layers that you've got, but you also have to control the number of parameters. And how do you actually tweak this number to get the, exactly the right thing? So in practice, no one does this sort of thing. So they don't, yeah, they don't try and tweak it too much, or the network too much, to find the right network size. It's just too hard. That's mainly because there is a huge space to explore, yeah. and each training can take you a week. So for this, you could have explored a lot of topologies. Like, this is a very simple problem. But something that takes you a few hours to train, you're not going to be able to do this. So the second one is an interesting solution that is quite popular. So the idea is that we modify the network uh, and add something called a dropout layer. So what is dropout? Oops, Mac, different. OK, so dropout layer, it's actually very simple. Uh, where's the at? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the at sign. Well, oh, it's, it's fine if I noticed. Yeah. Like, ah! No, uh, that, that's pretty hard. Wait, where's the brackets? <laughs> Sorry. It's <laughs> graphics and these two guys. Yeah, it's ugly, I know. Holy crap. The, the Cody bracket. Yeah, uh, yeah oh, shift yeah. of graphics. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> ah! So we use this, this laptop to have a GPU available. Uh, <laughs> let, let me do <laughs> But it's. OK, there you go. OK, so dropout, it might seem like, if you, if you try and apply this to something, it might seem like it does nothing. It just does nothing. So it actually has two different behaviors. So during training and during evaluation, it has very different behavior. So during evaluation, it does nothing. It's just the, an identity. But during training, and you can put this over here, it's under, uh, what is it? Net evaluation mode, yes. So there's a, a clever thing. Um, OK, I've got uh, <laughs> OK, you don't have to write this, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can be my <laughs> interpreter. OK, you can, yeah, you can interpret. Okay. Okay. OK, basically, during training mode, what it does is that it randomly sets out values to 0. Uh, and the other ones are scaled by the probability that you're setting them to zero. So the 0 0.3 means it's a probability of 0 0.3 that a, a value gets set to zero. So it's basically just adding noise. So this noise, it, it tries to make it, the learning process more robust. So it says, OK, we're just going to corrupt inputs. And the network still has to learn what to do. <coughs> and every time it runs the network, every time it calculates gradients, it just gets randomized. So it, the one intuition is that it tries to make it robust, the training. So the other way of seeing it is that it, it, it augments the data. So it, it sees different activations, even for the same small, well, if you have like 10 training examples, you know, when it gets through these dropout layers, the training example looks a bit different, because now it's got zeros everywhere. So this thing, if we run it now, so this was the same capacity as the as original network. 
300 units, the same length, everything. And if we see the training now, OK, well, we're just going to train it for the same time. And if we plot it, look at that. This thing is much smoother than the original one, which was this thing here. So it's smoothed out a lot. It's made it a lot more, uh, yeah. And if we look at the actual training curve with the validation set, <laughs> magic happens. So it's tracking it very nicely. Okay, well this is. So this is actually, yeah, you know why that happens. <laughs> magic. So it just makes the learning job a lot harder. So then it can't easily, as easily fit that noise that you had in the data because there's always more noise coming in. So it learns to be robust to noise, put it this way. There's also interpretations with model averaging and things, but I won't go to that. OK, so this is very simple. And a sort of standard probability for dropping out is like 0.3. Like that's a magic number that a lot of people use. <coughs> And one, one thing that you should be very careful though of is that if the network, you can see here, you know, there's like 200 units, and if there was one unit over here and you put a dropout after that, you know, it can stop the training completely quite often. So it's a bit dangerous unless you have, you know, at least a f tens or something of, of units that you can drop out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's a suggestion here that says, instead of using a dropout of 0.3, we can have, oh, we could have a 0.5 and then like two 0.3s after that. Yeah, or say, take one 0.3 out and just just have two dropouts of one. Second. But right next to each other or, or after? No, in this row. No, like, like remove like this after guy the and put yeah. 0.5 here. Like you have a stronger one. Oh, I see, yeah, I see. Stronger dropouts and not as, as many. So, if, if you do that, if you have too strong a dropout, it basically slows down the training to like a halt. Okay. So I'll get to this now. This is actually one of the major problems with dropout. OK, so dropout, yeah, it, you can see it, does, it has a very nice effect. The major disadvantage is that it slows down the training. Because it's corrupting the data, it has to train for much longer to get to the same learning as what, as what it usually does. So it, yeah you pay the price in training time. So the other one that is quite common, although it's fallen out of popularity a bit, is alter rigorization. <coughs> so what this is, there's an option here. You say method, and then whatever method you want to use. The common one is Adam. This is just the training method. And there's something called alter rigorization. And what this does is it, it penalizes the weights being too big. So it basically tries to constrain the weights. It's very similar to saying, OK, you know, if, if the weights can be any, or the, yeah, the parameters of the network, if they can be anything, there's a lot more capacity in the network to, to learn. But if you constrain them to be in a certain area, so in this case, you're saying, OK, we're going to say we're adding to the loss the squared, uh, the total, yeah, so we're just going to square all the weights and total them and add that to the loss. And that sort of penalizes yeah, it being in a big range. So it forces it to be in a very small range, and it reduces capacity. There's also sort of Bayesian interpretations of this as being a map estimate. Yeah? What is the um, default method of learning? Uh, Adam. Yeah. So this is the default. And we've chosen that by being, <coughs> in our experiments, it's worked the best, and it's also I think it's the, yeah, lots of frameworks use that as the, the default right now. But maybe, yeah, if that changes, if there's a better method that comes out, then we'll use that. So just like a small history thing, that in the past, the sort of methods of optimizing neural networks have been quite flaky, and you've had to tweak lots of values to get it to train. So this is one of the major advances that have happened, is that certain optimizers that are completely robust, that just always work. Okay, 
So we can now show this as well. And as you can see, this is much smoother. But there are some problems. So for example, what happens if I change this thing to like that? And well, what do these numbers mean? Like, the, what is the scale of this number? Like, is, is 0.2 the right thing? Who knows? And you can see this is not even training. It's just flat. So this is very sensitive to this value. And that's why it's not used very often. Because it's not clear what, what the right value is. You put it slightly too much, and it just stops training. It does nothing. So it's a common way of doing things, but yeah, it's not popular anymore. Dropout is much easier to use because you can just set, OK, 0.3 probability. It has a, you know, it's, a, it's something you can use for everything. Yeah? So you put in as many as you, as improves the generalization error at the end. Here's one. Trial and error. But in general, there's no harm in terms of the performance. So okay, so the performance, if you have a dropout layer after every single layer, after every yeah, linear layer or something, the performance generally will be, be it will be better than if you have just a few. But the training becomes very slow. So it's this weird, it's a sort of toss up between, you can trade out a bit of speed by just taking a few out. So like, kind of in, in general, putting together neural networks, you just very kind of try something and then you wait for it. And then I'm going to get to the recommendations now. now. So I'm, I'm just going through a, little, a few things, that ideas of what people have tried to control overfitting. And then I'll, I'll tell you what I think is the best uh, <laughs> sort of solution. OK. So the last uh, the next one is early stopping. So what early stopping does is that you give it a validation set and say, OK, you can train for whatever time you want, but take the, the answer with the best validation set performance. So OK, we're going to train this. We've got a validation set. We can see it's decent. Now it's going up again on the validation set, up. But NetTrain automatically takes the one that minimizes the thing on, um, uh, on the validation set, the performance on the validation set. And if I plot this now, it's pretty reasonable. It's not overfitting too much. And these are, this is a very plausible fit through these points. So. There are slight downsides. For example, if you, if you don't calculate the validation loss fast enough, there's a chance that you know, it can overfit quickly before you see what the performance was in the validation set. But that's an easy thing to control. The last one, obviously, is that overfitting is fundamentally a symptom both of a model that can fit too much, but also of having too little data. So if you had infinite amount of data, there's no such thing as overfitting. So on the other hand, you often can't get more data. Like it's an expensive thing to get. If you had more data, you'd be using it already. So one exception to that is something called data augmentation. And for certain fields, like for images, it's an extremely useful technique. So basically, you say, let's have an image. And let's, do, let's say we're doing a classification job. We're classifying this image as, yeah, I don't know, teapot or not a teapot. So one thing is that you can do any transformation on this thing that doesn't change the label. So for example, reflecting it, that's as much of a teapot as that thing. But they're different pictures. So if you use both of them together, it's a bit more data or more information to the network than it had before. And you can go on and on with this. There's, there's a lot of things you can do. So the most common things are like rotations or crops. So you, know, you could rotate this picture a little bit, it's still a teapot. You could crop it a bit, so like you know, cut it out somewhere there, it's still a teapot. So we have a layer, actually, that does, that does this. So it, it randomly says, OK, sometimes we're going to, half the time, we're going to reflect things. Uh, sometimes we're going to rotate it a bit. And you can control these settings in, in this. So this is a very common technique to improve overfitting and also improve uh, generalization, because it's seen more data. What are these parameters? Oh, sorry, this is just the, the output size. Okay. So you say, yeah. 
Uh, so it basically, if there's an image of size 300, it'll take a crop of 100 by 100. And then you can also, like there's rotation probability and I think, what is it? I forgot all the, all the parameters are in the documentation. Okay, so my recommendation for this, this actually, the sort of modern way of doing neural networks is quite simple. So make sure that the first thing, most important thing, is that the network is big enough. So a big network is almost always the right thing to do. Just make it big. So the cost of bigness is that it takes longer to train. Well, sometimes not even that. Because it's, yeah, we'll see now why. Then take something like 10% of the data for a, valid, for, the, for a validation set. Unless you have a truly tiny data set, you can often afford this 10%. It's not ideal, but you can probably spare it. And then you can use, you, you put this in a validation set, and you can actually, there's a very simple thing. If you want to automatically take 10% of your data, of your training data for a validation set, then you can use scales of, yeah, of 0.1. It's just a, no. So the default is not to use anything. So what you can also do is, if you have a small data set, uh, yeah, sorry, the net train, you just train it until your, you know, your validation performance starts going up. Just stop it, and it takes the best value. What you can also do is you can say, okay, the best value was at this, this iteration. Let me put back my data. Let me use the full data set now and only train up to that, that iteration to, use, to get a slightly better performance, to get with the extra 10%. But you always have to use, like validation data, it's hard to get away with that with any other method because you have to somehow see whether you're getting better. And if you don't keep 10% keep to see that, you're out of luck. But if you really need that data, then you can always add it back and then just train up to that iteration number because you've validated that the network is, yeah, is not overfitting in that regime. But in general, you can just stop it and then you have something that, that usually generalizes very well. And big networks, the reason that they not, don't necessarily even go slower is that they, they get to optimal performance much faster. So after a few iterations, they start overfitting, and you get to the, a good generalization error quite quickly. OK. So the time is, yeah, let me, let's yeah, go. We'll go, go on. Yeah, fine. So the next major problem that people face is the normalization of the data set. So what does this mean? So in the past, people have had huge difficulties training very deep networks. So if you read the literature uh, from the 80s and 90s, deep networks, they just didn't train. And people sort of figured out eventually why they didn't train. OK, there's some <laughs> shaking of heads. There are some counterexamples to this. But in general, deep networks had difficulties training. And one of the reasons why they had difficulties training was that the initialization procedure was, was bad. So what would happen is that you'd initialize a bunch of these layers, and as the data goes through this, it starts tending towards zero, or infinity, it blows up or something, and the gradients become crazy. So one of the major advances that, have, that has made deep learning very easy to use is that initialization is now a solved problem. And the initialization actually depends on for example, like what activation you use. So like ramp has a different initialization to 10H. So we automate this whole process. We scan your network and see, okay, this is the topology. We can find a good initialization. But this initialization, it makes one fundamental assumption. It assumes that your data has mean of zero and variance of one. And the optimizer also makes an assumption like this. So it's tuned for the same thing. It says, okay, we're assuming that the network has been initialized with, in a certain way, and we're assuming that the data is coming in looks normalized as well. And then we can choose what the initial step size will be. So the entire system is tuned to work with, um, with data that is normalized. And if you don't do that, you can get problems. So here's a simple example. So just a, a sum net, we saw this earlier. And we're just gonna, instead of using the net encoder for images, we're just gonna use raw data. So we're just extracting the data, the image data directly, 
And we're going to add, let's say, 100 to the image data. Pretty simple. We get the, the training data, and we start training. Why is that blue line there? <laughs> Something is weird with that blue line. But if you see this thing here, this line, it's not, I don't know what the validation set is doing. But OK, but the other line, it's just flat. It's not learning. Previously, you saw it going down very nicely. And if we modified this, if we didn't add any to anything to this, uh, it will go back to training, I think. There we go. Look at that. So you might notice that the image data is actually not normalized. It's between 0 and 1. So it's somewhat robust to data that is not perfectly normalized. Uh, but the further away you get from that, the, the greater your chance is of things going wrong. So the recommendation is, yeah, like if you have problems of convergence, the first thing to try is, how, yeah, what does your data look like? Don't just throw anything at it. Make it normalize it. And things like classify and predict, internally they do this. This is one of the nice things of using classify and predict. It's that users don't have to worry about issues like this one. Like things just, yeah, we, we automate this process for you. But for the neural network framework, we don't want to do a huge pre-processing pipeline because we, you, know, you might be feeding us data that is coming. We can't look at all the examples at the same time. Like there's a generator syntax for that. So it's hard for us to normalize, to look at the global data set, because it's not necessarily there. We, can, we support out-of-core training. So we need some way you know, that, uses, that it's up to the user to, to make sure their data is in the right form. Uh, OK, I think it's almost finished. Um, I'm going to miss this one for now. And yeah, I guess there's two minutes left, so that's not much. OK, I guess I'll just mention, if you want to look at this notebook yourself, what, what the last sort of piece is, uh, what you have look, to look forward to in your hotel room this night. Uh, so there's a, a pretty complicated network that is all these tasks together. So there's, if you run this whole thing, you get this lovely thing, one network that does segmentation, summing, and counting together. And this is one of the cool things with neural networks is that you can, you can have a single network that does lots of things at the same time. And it can actually improve the performance of things, of, of all the separate tasks by doing them together. Because you have, you're effectively showing it more data. And you've got a, a processing piece that has to generalize to many, different, uh, many more data points, let's put it that way. Uh, but yeah, so this is what, what this last example is going to be. You have some, uh, some big network that has three different losses. And you can train this thing, and yeah, you'll see what happens. Uh, and yeah, there's also there's some links that we've got. So for example, for multitask learning, one problem is like how much does each loss count for in the, the learning? And there's ways of automating this. There is something we should mention about this. Yeah. Like running this thing now will will not work for segmentation because of this very reason. I, I take that out because I, I, I wanted to show it like happening live. Perhaps. Okay, fine. So what you should do here is that so you oh, have you three losses, out, yeah. one for counting, one for summing, and one for segmentation. And in, in principle it is not clear. Like what you optimize in the end is some combination of these three losses. But it's not clear what coefficients you have to put in front of each guy. So if you do nothing, the train will just sum them for you. So same, same weight. But here, actually, you have to, to weight the um, uh, segmentation loss, which is this guy, with um, actually a fairly big coefficient. So the syntax for this is using scale. And this should be something like 10 to the 5. So you have to literally put a, a, a 10 to the 5 in front of the segmentation loss with, uh, to, to have the network actually train properly for all three tasks. Um, so yeah. So I would have liked to have shown the, 
yeah, the automatic method for this, but you can actually play with these losses and see what, what happens if you, if you don't tweak them. And one of the reasons for this, the problem is that if you have losses, like for example, the squared loss, you know, it, if it's wrong, it gets very big, like it can be 100 or something. Whilst things like cross entropy, they have a very different scale, like it's a much smaller loss. So if you weight them the same, it says, okay, the network, I'm gonna focus just on this one task. But you sort of want to have them be similar weight for each of the tasks. So this is just, yeah, it's an interesting. So here I'm training with one, 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 and I'm sure that it, it gets the count and the summary is gonna be well, but the segmentation will be completely off. There we go. It does something. Yeah, but. In, in, in order to get a very nice result, you have to put you have to put something like ten to the five here. Okay. Okay. Cool.